Our afternoon keynote speaker, uh, we've decided, is probably uh, deserving of the furthest traveled award today. And fortunately, he came from uh, the sunny country of Costa Rica, and it looks like he brought the sunshine with him. So we're really grateful for that. Uh, Jose um, Zaglul is the president of Earth University, an international, private, not-for-profit institution in Costa Rica dedicated to preparing leaders with ethical values to contribute to the sustainable development of the tropics and to construct a prosperous and just society. Dr. Zaglul has been president of Earth University since its inception in 1989, and he's provided the vision and leadership for this innovative institution and its unique educational environment that encourages the development of responsible leadership based on values, social commitment, environmental consciousness, academic excellence, and an entrepreneurial and enterprising spirit. Dr. Zaglul was the former head of the Animal Production Development uh, Department at the Center for Tropical Agricultural Research and Training in Costa Rica, and served as professor and vice rector of research and extension at the Costa Rican Institute of Technology. Dr. Zaglul is uh, the former president and current executive committee member of the Global Consortium of Higher Education and Research for Agriculture, GACHERA, and is a member of the advisory board of the United World College Costa Rica Foundation. He holds a PhD in animal science from the University of Florida and two master's degrees in food science and human nutrition and animal science. Welcome, Dr. Zaglul. Thank you so much, Sarah. And, um, I must tell you, um, I flew from Costa Rica to Newark, and it took me longer to get from Newark to Cornell. <laughs> <laughs> what a country. Uh, um, you know, I, I was telling a story the other day in Washington, which is a true story, uh, but uh, about three months ago, President Obama came to Costa Rica and I was introduced to him, and uh, they told me to introduce myself to President Obama. So he said, uh, Barack Obama, President of the United States. I said, I'm Jose Saglul, President of Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, there was this silence in the room. And, and, and then I heard that he was depressed like for two weeks. But uh, <laughs> I said, if you behave, you may become President of Earth. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to join you today. Uh, it's a great honor for me and the institution I represent to, to be part of this event, and I want to congratulate you on the celebration of your 50th anniversary of the international programs of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences of, at Cornell. You, you have influenced a lot of lives, students, institutions, and organizations around the world. And uh, for all of us, and I think I'm the only one from another university that is not, that, I mean, from south of the border, really. But for many of us, Cornell represents, uh, has a very high reputation in our countries and uh, has been uh, an inspiration for other educational institutions. And actually, Cornell and the, um, other land-grant colleges over the years have made, and, and you heard it this morning, the tremendous work in, uh, in improving agriculture and livestock and, um, and bringing solutions from the research to communities and industry. And perhaps uh, without uh, what you have done overseas in, uh, in, uh, in other countries, uh, perhaps many people would have starved to death with, without, if we hadn't improved the production capability of, of those countries. And, and um, so your role has been very important, not only locally, but internationally. But as time passes, we also have seen, and, and what we are doing in agriculture, um, we have seen also the impact in the environment, and even in uh, the deforestation, uh, water management, et cetera. And, and although some changes have been made, um, there's still a lot we need to do uh, to, to, to think of a, a future that is sustainable. 
Uh, for the first time, it was our generation that was able to see the, our planet from above. And uh, we have seen how fragile it is. And not only that, it's almost insignificant in terms of what's up there. And there is no other place to go. This is, the, this is our only home. And we depend so much on each other. Deforestation in the rainforest uh, will take away 50 and 80 percent probably of the biodiversity of the world if we not take, don't take care of it. And it will affect the weather a panel in other, a pan, a pattern in other parts of the world. So, and even now with globalization, what decisions you take in subsidies in agriculture here affect us in the South. With, globally, with global markets, um, food production is, is not more anymore local, it's, it's international. And our students need to know about the impact of uh, this uh, internationalization or, or this, this global pattern. Um, but I think we have the tremendous capa capacity. Humankind have been able to innovate, discover, um, even prove some uh, theories that later we find out uh, that, that they were true. And so the capacity to change, we have the capacity to change. And we have been able to go to space, to other galaxies. When we go to space, look what we did. These are satellites and debris from collisions of, of uh, objects in space. And if you look at the contamination of Earth, look what's happening also out there. Everywhere we go, we seem to contaminate. We, should, we need to, become, to be more careful in how we manage our resources and how um, we protect the environment and the world. So um, I think that uh, we as academic institutions have the tremendous uh, responsibility and I think the great opportunity to change the world. And I say that because if we consider the academic institutions where thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of students come to our uh, uh, campuses, our classrooms, if we could instill of the, in, in them the leadership and the capacity, because we have done a lot of good things, but we have not been able to alleviate poverty. We still have about a million and a half people that die of curable diseases of something as simple as diarrhea. The contamination, the, the devastation of the, of the forest, the rainforest. And more importantly, we have not been able to achieve peace in the world. I thought that after the Cold War, we'll have a world of peace. And I think we're having more wars and more devastation than ever. So, we have that, this young group of men and women that come to our classrooms. And, uh, and we believe that if we train those people to be the leaders of the future, we can change the world. And this is how Earth was started. It was in the mid 80s. And somebody talked about war recently uh, in the previous talks about how people in Africa were killing each other. Well, in the 1980s, Central America was the really the hot spot where conflict and uh, revolution, the Contras and the Sandinistas were fighting in Nicaragua and in Salvador were the same thing. In Guatemala, Noriega was in Honduras. And it's incredible, when there is war, there is money. And the East and the West were pouring money to our countries, basically to, for the armies and for, for, for both. And, uh, so there was a lot of money for Central America. And Costa Rica, that abolished the army in 1948, they said, don't give us money for arms. Give us money for education, and perhaps we can change the world. So believe it or not, in a, in a record time, Earth um, was established with USAID money. It was probably the largest grant that USAID gave at that time in Latin America, even with money for a small endowment that was given to us, and also with the great support of the WKK, uh, the Kellogg Foundation, and also the government of Costa Rica, we established Earth University. And this was, and really it's a small institution, but with a global dream. 
you probably don't know where Costa Rica is, you know, it's so small, but we're at the center of the Americas. And uh, we have a campus of about 8,000 acres, the property where Earth is located in the Atlantic side, the middle of the rainforest. And then we ha have another campus in the dry, what we call the dry tropics. In the rainforest, it rains 13 months per, per year. And, uh, but however, in the dry area, you have six months of rain and six months of total drought. So we have two campuses, the one in, in Guanacaste, it's in a very nice uh, touristic area, it's about uh, 4,000 acres, and the other one is about 8,000 some acres. And it came, the one in the rainforest, it came with a banana plantation, about 300 hectares, I will tell you more about it. So we, we believe that if we form the right leaders, we can change um, the countries. And we were organized as an international, uh, private, nonprofit institution. And uh, this is part of our campus in the middle of the rainforest. And our mission is very simple, very short. is to prepare ethical leaders for sustainable development in the tropics and construct a just and prosperous society. I wish all of us had that mission, but you only take tropics out. And anything you, we do is because we want sustainability, we want leadership, we want a prosperous, a just society. How do we do that in a world that uh, sometimes we, we, we seem not to tolerate each other? And we think that the greatest tool we have to alleviate poverty is education. I can tell you from, uh, from my own experience, and I'm the son of immigrants that uh, left the country because they wanted their kids to study. And I can see the difference that from my grandfather to my father to, to my siblings and myself, what education has done. But we make it so difficult for the poor people to get a good education just to pass the SAT exam. You know, they don't even know, if you go to the Amazon or you go to the most remote areas, these kids will never have an opportunity to come to a first class institution. We don't give them a chance. We want the brightest and the best that score in the exam, but these kids are bright, but they didn't have the opportunity. So we decided that we were going to break that paradigm and we decided to have a different admissions process. Instead of the students coming to us, we go and look for them. And it's the faculty itself that some, during some periods of the year, they go to the different countries uh, in Latin America and Africa looking for our students. These kids are, this is a young professor, she was young, uh, and these are indigenous kids, but they would have never heard about Earth. And we go and try to encourage them to apply. We tell them what we are. We go to the Amazon. We go to Petén in, in, in Guatemala. We go to Chocó in Colombia. We go to, just name it, to the most remote areas where probably nobody has ever gone. We try to, to encourage the students to come. And then we give them an exam, the SAT exam that is done in Spanish. But really what we do is also to interview each single student and looking for the values for honesty, leadership, uh, commitment to go back to their countries, uh, respect for others. And in the interview, we are not a specialist in anything, but the interview we try to look at each other's eyes and discover each other and see whether this is the kind of kids that we want to, to have. Because if we want to, to start with the people that really want to make a change and believe that they can make it. Although they are very young, we choose the students and they come to a program where we have, we are, a, we are a small institution, but we have a global dream. We want to change the world, really. And um, we have students now from 35 countries, from all over Latin America and the Caribbean, the Middle East, and, uh, and Africa. And our faculty, fortunately, the Costa Rican government gives us some uh, incentives to bring faculty from overseas. They don't have to pay tax, they don't have to pay rent, so it, for them, uh, for international faculty, we can uh, um, recruit from different countries. We have 20 countries represented from the faculty. And 60% of our students receive a full scholarship that 
it, that, that means tuition and room and board. And when the student comes to Earth, maybe they come from weak high schools. And you know, some of us have gone to universities where you go to the biochemistry class and there is 100, 200 students in the class and the professor tells you, you know what, only one third of this class is going to pass. Only the best ones will pass. I'm a very tough professor. The first day I went to that class, I was flunking the first day. But we decided that we will change that, that we will provide all the support to the students, motivate them to, stu to study. We put peer students, especially in science and math usually from the other years, people that are better off in science to help them uh, to improve. And, and we have seen, we have proven that students that come from weak backgrounds, if you provide the support, the motivation, and the experiential and participatory learning that we have, they become great students and great professionals. But we don't do that with usually in our academic uh, world. Of course, we choose the, the best and the brightest. That's very easy. You can teach great courses. You don't have to differentiate because you have top students. You don't have to make that extra effort. But if we want to change the world, I think we need to reach to those that deserve it. And we are given the opportunity, basically, only to those that have the, the resources, or those that have the, the, the conditions to, to connect. What about the rest of the world? So we decided to do this, and, and we have a, a model that we call experiential and participatory. We don't even have departments talk, talking about interdis interdisciplinary uh, um, way of teaching. We actually, people from the same disciplines, the offices are very far away from each other. And we are organized by groups that is not by departments, but by groups of faculty, usually that teach first year, second year, third year, and fourth year. Our program is a four-year program. We start in January on Monday at 6.30 in the morning, finish on Saturday at noon. We start in January and finish on by the 20th of December. So it's four full years and they graduate with 200 credits. But our, our, our system is participatory and experiential. The professor becomes a facilitator of the learning process. The students we don't have more than 25 students per class, so we divide the classes by 25. And the students are put in groups, and they, the professor helps them to discover knowledge. They give them exercise. And one of the things that we want, having students from many different countries and many different socioeconomic backgrounds, is that they need to listen to each other when they discuss. And this is kind of conflict resolution, because we want people uh, to respect each other's opinion, to listen to each other, and come to agreement based on discussion that will break that cycle of violence, that if you don't agree with me, I'll kill you. We don't want to be like that. So the, the whole experiential and participatory learning is, is a process where the professor is a facilitator, and we instill values in them. And we, these are the four pillars that sustain our program. Um, the technical and scientific knowledge that is traditional in all institutions, the only difference is that our program is, is uh, experiential and participatory, and as I explained before, the professor is, uh, uh, or they are the ones that are engaged, who are centered in the students. In all of our courses across the curriculum, there is the social impact and the environmental impact that we looked into. Then there is the ethics and values. We want them to be respectful, honest, and then the entrepreneurial spirit that I'll explain in a minute. But in the technical and scientific knowledge, they, we have a, a modern campus with equipment, with good faculty. And I already explained this a little bit about the, uh, the, the, the participatory and experiential learning. They get very solid. Uh, and we put the emphasis in the learning process, not in the teaching. Because the teaching, the, the emphasis is the professor. The learning is how the students learn and whether they are learning. So the, the importance is that not all of them learn at the same uh, uh, speed. So we have to pay attention to each one to see that they are learning. And what our interest is to see how the students are learning, not, how, not if you finish the chapter in 45 minutes and you forget about them. 
And the other thing is that the faculty are available for the students all day. The offices are in front of the classrooms. There is not even secretaries in front of the offices of the faculty, so that there is always a constant interaction between the, the faculty and the professors. And even the classrooms are made in such a way that there is always an open space where you can bring a tractor, an animal, uh, whatever. You can have the experiential process in the same classrooms um, so that, the, the, that the, stu the student touches, discovers, understands the theory and the practice. And I wanted to bring this picture here because there is the professor, a student from Nicaragua, a student from, uh, uh, from um, Kenya, and, uh, and the family. Every week, the students spend at least one day uh, and, the, and the faculty uh, understanding the challenges that the people in the rural sector have. And together, learning from the, from the families and, and, and in a, in a two-way uh, interaction, we try to understand and resolve together the problems that they have. So that the knowledge that the students get of, of the real world, they experience it every week, at least once per week. And then they spend seven weeks in the third year living with a family, like that family. They even see opera, the TV with them, and they, they, they have to understand the whole dynamics of the family. And they also work two days in a big industry. But at least they spend, they know the social implication that uh, rural families have, the challenges they have, and how to solve those problems. And then there is the ethics in everything we do. Uh, and ethics is probably not so difficult to teach in a class, but really ethics are learned by example. So we have to take decisions, we have to behave in a way that we ask them to do. You know, if, if we want to be honest, we have to be honest in, in, in the way not only we teach, the way we, uh, we are in class, the way we treat the students. So respect, honesty, uh, conflict resolution by dialogue, etc., is practiced in class, with the community, in the lab. And finally, th there is this other part that is very strong in our curriculum, which is the entrepreneurial mentality. All the students have to form a company while they are in the university. And we all live in, on campus. Uh, in the, so group of four to five in the first year, they put together a, a company, and they have, they have to be kids from different countries, different, different socioeconomic backgrounds so with the gender mixture. And they come with an idea, and we give them a loan. Uh, once they pass the feasibility study that has the financial, social, and environmental implication, we give them the loan, and then they go by themselves. It's not a class project. It's from zero to marketing their product. And it takes them two years, and they have to close the project before they go to an internship for three months uh, outside the university. But that totally transforms the mentality of the students. Instead of wanting to go and work, they want to go back and, and create a company. They become job creators rather than job seekers. And we didn't plan this to, for them to grade them by how much money they make, because sometimes when you fail, you understand more of the business. But they don't want to, <laughs> they want to make money. So 70% of the projects, somehow, they, they come and they, they have, we, they either break even or make money. So our loan fund that we thought will be deplenished the first year has been growing over the years. Now we give them an, oh, they have to return. After they pay the interest, and if they use land, they have to pay the rent of the land and everything, equipment. Two thirds of the net income goes for them. And one third comes to the university for the loan fund. Now, over the years, this loan fund has been increasing. But now we want them to be innovative. So we are telling them, instead of returning 33%, that is, there is a real innovative project that is risk taking. They only have to return 10%. And that way, we try to encourage innovation in the, in the new uh, projects that they make. And it's incredible. Those, those kids have taken some of their projects back home, and they have started their own businesses. So the whole thing is how to do, how to be sustainable, how to create jobs, how to protect the environment in a way 
uh, or how to do business in a way that we, you benefit society and you improve the environment. Uh, research, I wanted to, to show a little bit that uh, we, we have relationship with other institutions. Actually, we have one here, uh, the SRI RISE, with, uh, that uh, we have been working with uh, here uh, with Cornell. But we have uh, research with other Latin American institutions. Um, one of them was very interesting, was on the Chagas disease. I don't know whether you've heard about the Chagas disease, but it's, uh, it's a disease that uh, affects the, about 80 million people in Latin America. It's endemic to Latin America. It's, trans it's transmitted by the kissing bug, and it has a parasite inside. Once it, it goes into your bloodstream, it goes to usually to your heart, and it has no cure, but it's called the poor man's disease because this bug is usually in thatch houses in where poor people live, and no uh, pharmaceutical company wanted to get involved. And about uh, 50,000 people die per year. That's a lot of people dying without counting those that are, are a disease. So we went into this project uh, with, uh, with several institutions in, uh, in Latin America and the Uni University of Alabama, the Crystallography Center in Alabama. We were able to crystallize seven, five enzymes from the parasite, and we took the, this was the first uh, project that went to space from Latin America, and we went to space because in almost zero gravity, you can crystallize proteins in a much better way, and then you can see the molecular structure and try to find a blocking agent for that vital enzyme for the parasite. Unfortunately, uh, we, we, we were successful in also finding some blocking agents from the rainforest, but the project ran out of money because it was all from the U.S. Congress, and somehow the after after the war conflict, they stopped uh, uh, giving us money for the project. So it's still going on, but with, uh, not with as much uh, resources as, as we wished. But uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, the, the, the relationship we have with institutions has taken us from that type of project to this one. This is a simpler one that, uh, uh, we had 300 hectares, which is about 900 acres of banana production in the property. And uh, they used to throw all the plastic bag that cover each banana bunch to the rivers. And the center part of the bunch where the bananas are held, once you take the bananas out, that center part with the plastic used to be thrown to the rivers. It was tons and tons of plastic in the rivers and in the ocean. And the turtles were dying because they will think that it's food with a blue bag, and they will have plastic in their digestive tract. So we went to the banana companies and told them, that was 20 years ago, 24 years ago, uh, that we had to, 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 to get rid of this. And they said, no, that's the cost of doing business. And it was very disappointing. You know, when you talk about people that are professionals, that are very good at doing things that, like what, what we said, producing high quantities of bananas, but when their, their values are not right, this is better not to have that kind of professional. And what's worse is that when we started collecting the plastic, recycling the plastic, making paper out of banana waste, I didn't, they took it out in, in immigration. I wanted to sell some for you, but... <laughs> But all our station is made out of banana paper, uh, and the plastic now is recycled into corners for the, and the pallets. And we, st we stopped using herbicides. We start using more organic fertilizer. And uh, at the beginning, the cost of, uh, and then we started to spray with uh, effective microorganism to, to, uh, to get rid of, uh, of a fungus disease called black cigatoca. And uh, at the beginning, picking up the plastic and doing that costs us 25 cents, US cents, per box of banana. And no company will pay us that extra cost. 40 pound box of banana. So if you, per pound of banana is less of a cent, but no company will pay for us for that. 
What's worst, and I, I want to say this because I think you should be aware, and I'm not going to say the name of the company or the person that said that, but they used to spray and they used to use a chemical that produced sterility to men in the 1980s. I used to work in a banana company before I came to take my PhD. So the head of the research department, I met him again already working for Earth, and I told him that we had to do, we had the chemical companies and the banana companies together to see whether we could do some research in, in trying to reduce the amount of chemicals. And I told him about the sterility problem that we were having in, in Costa Rica. And I don't want to talk about all the problems that the sterility produce socially in, the, in, the, in, the, in these people. And he told me, Jose, why should you worry about it? We are helping you. You have an overpopulation problem. So I say this because sometimes we talk about you know, the great advances of technology, the great things that we do. But if we don't have values, if we think that other people are less than you, there is no sense uh, on doing whatever we're doing. And we are placing our success only in material and, and, and monetary terms. And I think there is much more than that. So Whole Foods came and they said, we'll buy your bananas, we'll pay more for you. So we have a commercial activity. We export about 700,000 boxes of bananas to Whole Foods. So if you go to Whole Foods, please buy Earth University bananas. Uh, we also, we, today we are exporting some uh, frozen fruits, coffee, and they, they told us we're not going to give you any grant, but we're going to give you business. And so that has been a very, uh, what I see, a very interesting relationship between a, an academic institution and the private sector, working together, and, and they have this, uh, uh, where the bananas are, are put, they also say a few things about earth and sustainability. And I think that through the customers that they come to Whole Foods, we can also educate the customer that by paying a few cents more, you're also saving the environment, sending with the money that we make, we send a poor student to, be, to have a first class education. And that way we will all contribute to, to the improvement of, of the world. And, and I can talk a lot about Earth, but really, Earth is the graduates. I mean, you, you judge the institution by, by what the graduates are doing. And we don't measure success by how much money they make. Actually, we measure success by how much they give back to society. Uh, sometimes we, we mix what's happiness. And for some of us, we believe that happiness is related only to money. And, and I think it's much more than that. And that's what we want to, to see in our graduates. This one is a graduate from Honduras. He graduated in 206, he said, in, from the Miskitia tribe. And you know, in the, in the 1840s, 1850, when the British government moved away from Honduras, they gave the land to, the, to this group of uh, indigenous people. But they have, the government of Honduras had never honored the property that was given back to them. They, they had to have... Um, uh, you know, the papers that the, the land belonged to them. Well, this kid represents about 100,000 uh, indigenous. He's one of the first one that has gone to college. He graduated 206, and just uh, about a month ago, it was in the US papers too, uh, the government of Honduras gave, them, gave title of the land back to, to the indigenous people. This guy over there, it's not a very good picture, um, is a graduate of 1993. This year will be our 20th graduation. Uh, he's an indigenous kid from Panama. He's running for president of Panama. Uh, the young lady, Sharon, is from Uganda, from a very poor family. She went back to Uganda and she started helping the, the small uh, businesswoman to have access to information about the markets and prices. And now they have asked her to do the same. And she won a, a, an award in, in the Netherlands. And now they are asking her to do the same in Rwanda and other African countries. And these two guys over there, they are from the better off families. They were not very, these three kids were very, very poor. They would have never gone to college if we didn't bring them to, to earth. But these two men over there are from the middle class. 
Uh, they have transformed totally the city of Guayaquil. They are very uh, involved politically. They have, uh, they, form a, they have an event every year called the uh, Climate Change uh, uh, Meeting. And this past, the past two years, and they bring celebrities from all the world, leaders of the world to, uh, uh, to give talks and to involve the, the community. And this past two years, they, they, are start, they started doing the, um, this climate change uh, conference with kids from high school and elementary school. And they got the Guinness Book by collecting the largest number of plastic bags in, I know they had a, a mountain of, of plastic bags that they, they collected and got the Guinness Book for, for that specific event. So we believe in the power of individuals. We are not graduating 10,000 or 1,000 per year, but we believe that our alumni can be the leaders that can change their countries, their communities, their families. Um, you all were talking about um, international collaboration this morning, and very few talk about Latin America. It was Africa, Asia, everywhere, but we are next door. We are south of the border, the real south of the border. And, but we have a consortium of U.S. universities where they send students for a semester abroad to our program. We also do research together, courses together. Uh, in our campus, uh, we have all the facilities even for faculty to have uh, sabbaticals over there. And uh, in 1998, um, we also started a relationship with Africa with a seminar called SEMSIT. SEMSIT meant, it's very long, sustainability, education, and the management of change in the tropics. And the idea was to involve um, uh, African universities to, to learn from each other and to see how agricultural universities could, uh, could you know, form those leaders that we needed. And the other thing that you mentioned was Gechera, which is the Global Consortium of Higher Education and Research in Agriculture, where also agricultural universities from all over the world are working together in order to, uh, to improve uh, the education, break paradigms, break the walls of the university, become more engaged in, 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 in the real issues of, of the communities. And this last um, AUB uh, logo is because we have a, a, a program we're going to start with AUB, we're in the feasibility state at this moment financed by MasterCard. We want to create a master program in global health and sustainability with two institutions that are very far away from each other one without an army, the other one with a conflict. One very good in global health, we are good in sustainability. And we believe that if we join and bring together students from Latin America, the Middle East, and the US and Africa, maybe we can train the, also the future leader for a more peaceful uh, world. And my last comment, because they are, I thought she was saying hi to me, but I think it's five minutes, um, is that, you know, I think we need to work to, uh, to make this place a, a better place, but, it, but we have to change. We cannot continue consuming the same way we're doing. We cannot continue using the energy the way we're doing. We cannot have these disparities between uh, those that have a lot and those that have nothing. There will not be peace. You have to, uh, we have to believe that, uh, uh, creating that sense of belonging, of that we are all a one human race, that we should uh, give to each other and, and think that happiness is much more than money and, and, and material things. This has to be at the heart of our teaching and our programs uh, if we want to change the world. Thank you very much. Okay. take uh, 10 minutes or so for some questions, and there's a microphone right over here if you'd like to, to ask a question of Dr. Saklul.
How replicable is the Earth experience? Do you think that uh, an African country could recreate something like Earth, uh, or is it sort of a one-time event? And secondly, related to that is, uh, at least when I was there, Earth had, I think, 400 students. You may be up now, but it's still a relatively small institution. If you're an African country and you have thousands of students that are desperate for education, even if you could create an Earth-type in, uh, institution, would you choose, you know, choose that or choose uh, educational methods that would reach a broader group of people? Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, the, you know, I, I don't think you can take the air model and, and put it somewhere else. I, I, and that's why we started this program with Roo Forum and the universities in Africa. Actually, we've learned from them and they have learned from us. And uh, there is a great interest by, there was a great interest at one time by the government of Norway. Now there is another foundation that wants to create an Earth-like institution in, in, in one of these countries. We don't know which country. But I think it has to be with the, with, in case of Africa, with the African spirit. I don't think the same model is going to apply in, 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 in in Africa, but I think the principles, um, you know, one of the things about Costa Rica that gives that added value is that the country itself is very environmentally, you know, uh, focused. We want to be carbon neutral by the year 2021. Uh, we don't have an army. So those are things that when people come from outside, it's it's an added value to, to the learning process. So I, we, are the, we, we thought that by sharing our experience with other universities is the way that we can multiply our, the mission. Uh, we want to increase our student population, uh, starting the year 2015, to 500, 25 per year until we get to 500 students. But we know the name of each one. We, we, we eat with them, we play soccer with them. We, so in order to to have a leader, a person that believes and, and really is, is committed, you have to spend time and you have to, so 10,000 students, 5,000 students, I don't think you will get the same uh, um, commitment that when you massify education, in, in, at least in our case. So we believe in the power of individuals that in the, in, you know, Individuals can change the world. Norman Burlock was one, Gandhi, you know. So I hope that one of our kids will, will be one of those uh, agents of change for their countries. So I, in answer, I, I think that what we have noticed is that the universities of Costa Rica and some other in Latin America are already having an entrepreneurial program. They are talking about values. So, at least the example is good for others to, uh, you know, to, to, to replicate it in their own universities where there is uh, more students. Again, I do thank you for the presentation and I love the approach of an eye to eye and eye to eye contact. And I was wondering one of the major uh, reason for ad the poor advancement in developed countries. Everybody has a cell phone, everybody texting each other, everybody read uh, emails and so forth. Uh, I was just curious, what is the role of the IT in uni your university and what do you see as a tool that could be used in the future, at least to convey the message to other areas? I, I was in Washington in a meeting last week about that, and I thought I was the only one that didn't have that. Um, the other were replicating and had thousands of students using IT. Well, uh, we, we have some courses, and uh, actually we have some collaboration with other universities where we teach uh, <coughs> courses in, um, with, I, with, you know, with the technology we have. Um, what... Uh, what we feel that we cannot substitute is the personal relationship. I mean, you can teach technology. We, you know, we have uh, 
we produce these biodigesters, you know, instead of cutting wood, you can use animal ways to produce biogas and then burn it. I mean, you can teach that by, by just providing the information, but our, our, our role is, is, is that human part, that relation that you cannot substitute by, by just distance, education. So I'll say that at least our niche where, where we are is, uh, you know, creating that sense of belonging, creating that sense of, of uh, trusting themselves, self-confidence for the students. Uh, and this comes from very, very poor families, you know. It's probably the first one in the family to go to school. Or the, there was one was the first in the village to go to college. So providing that self-confidence and the capacity in, in four years to, to become a, a, a professional that will go out and, and make a change, I think that we cannot substitute with other technologies. <laughs> In here are agronomers who have graduated and they are doing an excellent job and I think the model has worked. But in a globalized world, what these agronomers tell me is that I wish I could have gone for masters. I wish I could have gone higher than what I have reached at Earth. So are there any long-term plans to take the model further so that these kids who come from village just don't end up with just an engineer or agronomer degree, but they could go higher? Actually, uh, in our uh, strategic plan, we, we are partnering with some U.S. universities like Chatham and, and uh, Michigan State, and I hope tomorrow we're going to have a meeting here. But if you see the number of credits our students take, over, and they have to do a, th a thesis and a research paper, we are we are trying to partner with institutions that we can give a joint master's program and perhaps do it in, in a year. But we are also creating a, a, a graduate program. Uh, we are in the process of, like this one with the American University in Beirut, a master's in global health and sustainability. We are also planning to have our, our own master's program just to, uh, to benefit those students that want to continue. And I, I think it's what, the demand is because these kids that go back to Africa, they are asking them to have a master's and, and the degree is not a master's. So it's the same uh, demand, although they, they are very well prepared. We want it to be like a terminal degree and they could become business people and they can create jobs, but the demand makes them wanting to get, and we have many that have master's and PhD from other universities in the States and Europe, but we do have in our program for the, for the Next year will be our 25th anniversary. No, 2015, almost next year. Uh, and we, we plan to start after that with our graduate program. Thank you for a fascinating um, talk. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one sort of intrigues me with all these students from different places and what language you actually, what language do you communicate in? Um, probably English and Spanish, but it's still a fascinating story. And the second one uh, that perhaps is relevant in this forum is um, from your perspective, um, how would you see the land grant universities supporting something that you're doing in your university. I'm sorry, the second, how do we? How do you see, how would you see land-ground oh. universities in the United States? We've, we've been discussing the type of ways that, that US, US land-ground universities could, could uh, be involved in, in, um, in the future. Sure. Um, and also funding. Um, and I'd be interested in, to know a little bit more about your perspective on, on it from your institutions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the language of instruction is in Spanish, and, but we teach English from the first day that they come. Uh, English is very important. Uh, you know, the first students that came to Earth, they were complaining about English. We didn't teach that much. But after they graduated, they wrote back to us and they said, I wish I knew English because if I knew English, I'll get twice the salary and professional development will be 
much uh, better for me. So now we teach English, intensive English from the first year. And we thought, well, if these kids come from very poor areas, you know, with difficulties, starting to teach in English will be another barrier for them. But now we're getting a lot of students from Africa, from 15 countries from Africa. We bring them three months before, we immerse them into Spanish, and they do very well in Spanish. So we said, we have to do the same with the Spanish speaking. And we want to convert our curriculum, at least to start, in the third and fourth year will be English. The courses will be taught in English. And first or second year will be Spanish with English, but f we want to enforce English to start in the third year and fourth year, so that they go out with, uh, with good English. Well, I started by mentioning that you haven't looked at the South so much, but uh, we have two campuses with uh, great properties uh, and land for research. You know, our, we have a, a, a primary rainforest in our campus and a secondary rainforest. And we have all this biodiversity, and, and plus we have intensive cropping like uh, bananas, etc. So I would like to see uh, a greater relationship with uh, land-grant universities and Earth, and not only Earth, it's Costa Rica. Costa Rica has an international center in tropical agriculture. There is the UPs, the University for Peace. There is INCAI, which is a branch of, um, uh, very closely related to to MIT. Uh, uh, there is the Organization of Tropical Studies that has, uh, is a consortium of US universities that have research in the tropics. So Costa Rica, a very small country, has all these educational opportunities and, and institution that we can relate to each other. But your presence has been gone since the 70s, I think. Uh, so actually, come down to earth. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. Thanks very much. It was very interesting. I really liked your emphasis on learning uh, outcomes and, and emphasizing the learning of the students as your primary focus. Uh, it's something we're trying to work on, too, and to change our thinking about that. What we struggle with is how to evaluate that uh, in terms of uh, uh, learning that the students really need, uh, the uh, individual uh, needs of students as, a, as, a, as an individual. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about uh, the way you evaluate and assess uh, the learning outcomes? Mm -hmm. Well, um, we have all been taught in disciplines. Uh, I mean, all of us, uh, so this whole change of integrated curriculum and, and putting emphasis on learning, we had to learn first, <laughs> and we're still learning. It's not easy, but, uh, but the truth is that not, not everybody learns at the same speed, or they have the same attributes. So somebody may be very good in math, but he's, or he or she are not very good in, in biology. So having smaller classes, working with them in groups, and putting you know, exercises, and so we know that a group is more, in math, for example, we have modules, so that not all of them are in the same class and the same in English. But in other disciplines, we try to, uh, to understand that X or Y person is, is not doing very well. And the faculty of first year, they meet every Monday. And so does the faculty of second year and third year. And we, because we're a small, uh, school. So we, we evaluate how each one is doing. You know, we, we give them exams. We know it, the other professors talk about the other student, how they are doing. And we try to, um, to help them outside the class. Not only in the class, but for example, they have open access to the faculty. The faculty are in their offices the whole day. At 6.30 in the morning, they are out in the field. And so that gives them a lot of opportunity to work in a one-to-one -one almost uh, capacity. And then, obviously, they cannot do that all the time. But then they, they, we put uh, students that are, are um, better prepared in that specific area to help them. And we monitor each one. So we have 
you know, even those students that, I mean, with students coming from those backgrounds, we have 86% of uh, success rate from the students that enter that those that graduate. 23% have their own businesses. And for each student that graduate from Earth, uh, counting from seven years back, because the new ones are still very new in, in the field, but we produce four jobs per graduate, which is uh, very interesting. So um, we have, and 84% are back in their countries. Well, what happens is that they get married to each other after four years. <laughs> so. <laughs> Really, 90, 92% are back in Latin America, but usually one takes the other partner to his or her country, and so we end up with 86 in their own countries, but they're back home. We have a lot of grandchildren now. <laughs> and they're, they are very loyal. They are very identified with the institution, and we try to bring them every, we have associations in each country of uh, Earth graduates, so they, and then when the graduates come from Earth, they go to the association and they help them find jobs. Now the same association have a business and they, they hire other graduates that come. So that's been providing a, a networking in each country to, to, to find jobs and, 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 and to maintain the values and the leadership of, uh, of Earth and, uh, and the mission. That's very important. Thank you, Dr. Zoglu. We'll take a, a 15 minute coffee break um, and come back at 3.15, but before we do that, please join me in, in giving a formal. <laughs>